Tonight's top story, Moorhead first responders are missing out on potentially life-saving time because of rail traffic. In fact, firefighters in Moorhead were stuck at a railroad crossing 118 times in just one year. Good evening and welcome to 630 Point of View. I'm Chris Berg. Thanks so much for joining us. Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith was in town today. She was speaking at the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo Chambers Eggs and Issues event. And after the event, she stopped by our studio. She and I sat down. We visited about Minnesota's economy, the possibility of a new underpass at 21st and Main in Moorhead, really to help out, obviously, these first responders I just mentioned. Also, had a little fun and found out if she's going to announce her candidacy for governor in the great state of Minnesota. With us right now, Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Minnesota, Tina Smith, also a Stanford grad. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I know you're at the Eggs and uh, Issues event this morning with the Chamber. And I want to comment on this. I mean, number one, kudos. Uh, last week, Gallup poll comes out with number one in the job creation index. CNBC last year, best state for business, best state to retire, second strongest. I mean, I can go down a pretty good list here for y'all. And I want to ask you this question because we had a, a conservative pundit on last week and he said, hey, look, here's the reality, Chris. I know this looks good right now, but the reality is the Republicans, when they had the Senate in the House, they laid the foundation to have this happen. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that when things are going well, everybody wants credit. And when things are not going so well, it's everybody <laughs> else's fault. And what we, the governor and I always say is that the root and the strength of Minnesota's economy are the great businesses and the great people that work here. And I mean, that's no lie. That's why things are going well. But there was some real fiscal discipline that uh, the governor and, and the legislature brought to Minnesota's uh, budget. And uh, I think that fiscal discipline, along with key investments, especially in education, uh, are paying off. So, you, you know, you guys raised the income tax, fourth highest in the nation. You, you raised minimum wage to 950, I think, in 2018. You've seen what's happened in North Dakota being so heavy in oil. What's been the secret to have these businesses stick around and continue to produce for you? Well, the key thing to remember is we raised income taxes on the top 2%, but we lowered uh, income taxes for about 2 million Minnesotans, middle class income uh, tax cuts. And we also lowered <laughs> property taxes by almost 175 million. And so I think that has really helped. But the th the strength of Minnesota's economy is that it is so diverse. I mean, we're strong in food and ag. We're strong in renewable energy. We're strong in uh, medical devices and other applied manufacturing. And so that means we can kind of ride the wave of the economy with some additional stability. You mentioned ag, and I hear a lot of farmers in our area, obviously in greater Minnesota, going, hey, my property taxes are just crushing me right now. We've talked to Representative Marquardt about this in the past, didn't quite get things done. Are you going to get something done in this upcoming session for the farmers? You know, Representative Marquardt does such a good job on this issue. I just actually was talking to him on Saturday about a number of things, including this challenge that we have in rural communities where the um, agricultural um, landowners are the ones that end up footing so much of the bill, especially for school levies. And then it means that those school levies aren't passing. And so I'm really interested in working with Representative Marquardt and others to see if we can't come up with a solution to that to uh, help communities. I want to get to, I know you talked about the underpass uh, over in Moorhead at 21st yeah. in Maine. And um, Paul Marquardt and I have had a big conversation around this. You just mentioned, you know, property taxes to help fund schools and last year we talked to Kurt Dow, the Speaker of the House. He said, Chris, I'm telling you, we get the Sandpiper pipeline built, we're going to take 80 percent of the oil off the rails, reduce a lot of the oil congestion. There was a recent poll that came out uh, that said, hey, a lot of people support the Sandpiper pipeline. I know the Republicans didn't want to fund the underpass last session, and I know it's in the courts now, we'll get to that in a moment, but would you have made the deal and said, hey, you know what? We'll make sure we green light the Sandpiper pipeline. You give us the $42 million for the underpass. Would you make that deal? Well, you know, the funny thing about the way our laws work in Minnesota is that the, <clears throat> what happens with the Sandpiper pipeline is our job is to make sure that the rules and the laws around environmental protection are followed. That's all with the Public Utilities Commission right now. And though Speaker Doubt might like everyone to think that if you're the governor or the speaker, you can just wave a magic wand and say we don't need to follow all those rules, that's just actually not the way our government works. Meanwhile, I think there's a lot of people in Moorhead who are worried about the, uh, I mean, I was talking to people today who said that their grandkids are going across those tracks four times a day. I talked to the fire chief who's discussing how what a challenge it is for his rigs to get on the north side to the south side and back and forth. And that is a that's a real issue of safety as well as um, economic development in this community. So I don't think we should be focused on solving that problem in Moorhead by uh, trying to 
by by shifting attention to the Sandpiper pipeline. That's Do you a whole support other the issue. Sandpiper pipeline? Or? I mean, I think if the Sandpiper pipeline can be done with uh, following Minnesota's uh, mm. environmental rules and regulations, then I think it should be done. So what I'm hearing is that the PUC actually said, hey, Judge Lipman said, yes, this is a good thing. The PUC said the pipeline's a good thing. And then it got put into the courts. Um, did the Supreme Court of Minnesota usurp their powers? Because they shouldn't really be deciding this, should they? Well, what I, I'm, uh, what I think is happening right now is that the, uh, the PUC has uh, set a sort of a new set of uh, kind of steps that um, Enbridge has to go through to get the pipeline through, and Enbridge is saying um, those steps are not reasonable, they're too much, it's, uh, it's too much for us to go through, and, you know, that's, I mean, honestly, that's going to be for the courts to decide. <laughs> okay, let's move on <laughs> to this. I got enough challenges without second-guessing <laughs> Minnesota's courts. So do you think that the underpass gets funded? I session. hope so. I mean, I mean it, we have a, the governor proposed a $1.4 billion bonding bill. And, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, that's too much. It's too big. But it is roughly the same size of bonding bill as Arne Carlson proposed in 1994 with a much smaller economy and a much smaller budget. We can support that amount of borrowing. I think it's actually good business for the state. And uh, we have to persuade enough people to vote for it. Well, I think the safety thing you bring up is so important. I think last year, 118 times, first responders were delayed and Clearly, don't, we don't want to see that happening. Um, let's move on to this session. And I think one of the things I want to get your comments on is I look at Minsky, which just came out where now 19 of the 31 universities uh, didn't pass the financial stress test. And I think the legislature's put some caps on the funding opportunities or tuition. What do you foresee happening? You know, Minnesota is such a great education state. What can you guys do to help shore up Minsky and keep it robust? Yeah. Well, our competitive advantage as a state is all about the talent and the skills of our people, and Minsky is a key part of that. And you go around the state to regional centers like Moorhead, and there's always one or two or sometimes three higher education institutions that are just so important. Now, one of the big problems we're having right now, Minsky is having, is that we're seeing declining enrollment, probably because the unemployment rates are so low and everyone is, you know, working rather than going back to school. So um, we have to, but we, you know, we have to fund our higher education institutions. I think we also have to make sure that uh, we, we tried to freeze tuition uh, last session and uh, couldn't persuade the speaker to go along with that. Uh, we thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, we also have to take a look at student debt, which is a real challenge. Minnesota has, I think, one of the top three or four um, rates of student debt. Uh, and that's going to mm -hmm. become a cap on our um, economic uh, capacity if you've got a high level of student debt, you're not going to be able to buy that car, buy that house. Right. Two quick questions. One, um, are you kind of a Bernie Sanders-esque on, hey, if it's a state college, it should be free or... You know, I'm a, uh, I, I think free college okay. is a That's, big step to take. I, I mean, it's expensive. And I also think that, uh, as Senator Kent Eakin said this morning, uh, everybody who's going to school ought to have some skin in the game themselves. It just doesn't need to be so much skin. So my last can't. question for you, I want to have some fun with this one with you. How about we make some news tonight? Do you want to announce your candidacy for governor here tonight? <laughs> or when, when are you going to make that announcement? I have no announcements to make. As I said earlier today, I'm, uh, I'm focused on the next, uh, the next day and the next week and the next year. And, you know, honestly... Uh, I think people are kind of sick of politicians that are constantly thinking about the next job while they're doing the job that they're doing, and I'm doing this job. All right. Thank you so much for being here. I really thank appreciate you. your time. Thanks so All much. All right. Stay with us when we come back. It is National Signing Day today. Brian Sean, who did our play-by-play -play for NDSU this season, is going to be joining us. We'll be breaking down some of the blue chippers that NDSU picked up to continue their national championship streak. As always, love to hear your thoughts about what Lieutenant Governor had to say. You can go to our website, 630pov.com. Text us, email us, we'll be right back.